everybody. So we are in January and we are going to begin our winter grow along. Um, one of the things I want to do with this presentation is provide you with a link to all of this information so you can access it anytime and you don't have to be worried about rushing through it when I'm doing it live. So I thought that I'd do a recording of all the information and that way you can refer back to it. Um, we're still going to do the uh, 3 p.m. live question and answer. So any questions that you have that are specific to something that you're growing or something that's still a little bit unclear after this presentation, please join me on the live. It'll be fun to connect with everybody. Just say hi. Show me what you're growing. Doesn't really matter. Um, but I thought this would be fun. And, you know, what else are we going to do in the middle of winter and in the middle of a snowstorm? We're actually getting six to ten inches tonight. Uh, I'm hoping more toward the six inches, but we'll see. Um, and Emma's very excited about that. So let's see. For the 2024 grow along, what I'm going to hope to do is provide you with some information on supplies that you would need to do indoor growing, winter sowing, um, and compare the ways you can grow seed. So you can grow indoors, you can grow direct seeding, which is directly out in the soil outside, and you can winter sow, which is in containers outside. We'll, we'll compare the differences there. We'll also um, show you the difference between the types of soil you can choose for your containers and how to plan your seed starting calendar. Um, that is gonna be super helpful and also be really critical to your success with seedlings because if you grow too soon or you grow too late with such a short growing season in 5B, we could really botch things up if we don't get our timing down. So I will show you exactly how to draw um, your information from seed packs and how to apply it to your seed starting calendar. So let's talk a little bit about what you're gonna need to grow seeds. Um, obviously for direct seeding, you really just need the seeds because everything else is gonna be taken care of for you outdoors. Um, but for indoors, um, in indoor growing and for winter sowing, you're gonna need seeds, trays and containers that are prepped um, in a soil or germination mix, plant tags and markers. Um, and then for indoor growing, it's a little more complicated because you need to sort of mimic the outdoor sunshine and a few other um, external variables that you would have when you're growing outside. So you're gonna need a grow light. Um, vermiculite is helpful, not necessary, but helpful. Heat mats. Um, humidity domes and a fan and I'm gonna go through why each of those things are important if you don't have them it's fine there are other things you can do but if you have all of those things it makes your life a lot easier when you're caring for your seedlings and you're trying to manage um, disease, um, diseases or pests inside so let's talk first about soil there's a couple different ways that you can grow um, different soils one is to go with a soilless based um, mix. And what that is, it's really got good drainage. It's got lots of perlite in it. Um, it drains really well and it's lightweight. So it's very uniform. Every little pot that you plant up is going to have the same consistency and it's a sterile mix. Um, if you use a compost based potting mix or germination mix, it's going to be really dark and earthy. It's going to be a little denser than your soilless mix. Um, it's a little heavier, but the reason it's heavier is because it's alive. It has microorganisms in it. It's nutrient rich. It's going to feed your seedlings. So when we talk about what's better, there isn't really a better one. It's just really up to your preference. So if you're going to go with the soilless mix, um, you have to think about a few things. One, it's going to need water more often because it drains quicker. So it's lighter, it's gonna dry out faster. So you have to sort of keep up on watering a little more often. You won't have to deal with as many fungus gnats as you would with compost-based mix. And that is simply because the organisms are in there, they're feeding on it. It's already built into the soil because it's alive. So you sort of can manage those later on if you go with the compost-based mix. Um, and for soilless mixes, you have to provide additional nutrients. Um, there's not going to be a lot of nutrition in the soil, so you do have to add a fertilizer or um, feed once the seedlings are up and not feeding off of the actual seed anymore. Um, you have to provide some type of a fertilizer or feeding regimen. Uh, the compost-based mix 
it definitely is going to hold water more. It has a peat base um, or a coconut pour base. Uh, they have nutrients already in it. So you're already going to have compost. You already have the nutrients that are going to be available for uptake. But you do have more of the fungus gnats. Um, and they're not, they're just a pain. They look like the little fruit flies, only, you know, they're a pain in the butt. They do like to multiply. You have to dry out your soil a little more. You can't just kind of leave it around. There's ways to manage those. And we'll talk about those later on. Um, but the good thing about compost based mix, it feeds your seedlings without additional fertilizer. So once you decide which one is you're going to try, there's no right or wrong there. So again, it's really just a matter of what your preference is. I actually tend to go more toward the compost based mix. Um, and that is just simply because I don't have to really feed much. And when you pot them up, you're potting them up in the same uh, potting mix. So they're going to get more nutrients and they just feed off of that initial soil where with the soil list, you just have to be on a better regimen for fertilizing because there's not a lot of nutrition and you're going to see your seedlings start to turn yellow. You're going to see them just start to look kind of weak and blah and you don't really want that. Um, so as long as you're good with the additional fertilizer at some point and a regimen that either one of these is going to work fine for you. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is containers. You can get creative with this. You can pretty much grow in anything you want, but there's a couple components that is pretty much that are pretty much required. You have to have drainage in the bottom. So I have a couple things pictured here in the presentation. And if you notice on the top left hand side, there are right here, we have plenty of different types of pots. I have reused nursery pots. I have little tiny uh, like three inch uh, square pots. I have solo cups. All of those solo cups are regular solo cups, but I did put holes in the bottom for drainage. And I do have a video on how I prep containers. So I am going to reference that um, on my Facebook page for anybody interested in watching how I prep the containers. Um, you can use these little peat uh, pots also on the bottom left-hand side. Those, they don't hold up for a very long time. So if you're starting daylily seeds, I would not recommend those because they really fall apart. They're kind of meant for like a really short-term seedling starting. So they're good for vegetables that are only gonna be in there for two to three weeks. But anything after that, they kind of do start to fall apart and they don't hold their shape well. Uh, let's see, the top right is what we use for winter sowing. So if you notice, it looks a lot like milk jugs because that's what we do. We prep the milk jugs, put about five inches of soil in the bottom and winter sow them. They go right outside. We leave the caps off. We'll get more into winter sowing in just a second. And then on the bottom right hand side, that is actual soil blocks. So there are... A, there's a tool, there's actually a couple different levels um, of soil blocks, but you can basically make these little soil blocks where there's no containers, no plastic at all. And these little tiny squares of soil hold up and they actually air prune as the seedling is growing. So you do have to pot these up into bigger soil blocks or into containers at some point, but you can make a ton of seedlings um, with a lot less plastic if you choose to go that way. I also have trays that I use. Um, they're called wind strip trays and they actually air prune also. They have little slits in the sides of the cells and that when the roots hit that, they're like, oh, I, I feel air. They actually turn around and go back in and use up all the available soil. So it's just a matter of what you have on hand, how, you know, how intricate you want to get with all the details of your containers and what you ultimately how many you're going to grow. If you're just growing to try some things for the first time, you don't have to go crazy on this. Um, but if you get into starting a lot of seeds and you know, kind of get some experience with how big things get and how much of things that you want to grow, then you'll start narrowing down exactly what you like to use and what works best, that sort of thing. Now for winter sowing, we're going to talk about that first. Winter sowing is basically letting mother nature do all of the work for you. So winter sowing is great for seeds that need a cold stratification, or if you don't have room to sow a lot of seeds indoors and you don't want to spend a lot of money on grow light setups and containers and fans and heat lights uh, or heat mats, you can do winter sowing. A lot of seeds will work well for winter sowing. You prep containers 
and they are going to look just like this with the milk jugs. So you basically cut the milk jug almost all the way in half, fill it up with soil, make sure your drainage holes are in the bottom, add your soil in there, seed it, and then once you water it in, you duct tape it back so it's actually kind of like a full gallon jug without a slit anymore, and it goes right out into the garden. You can use 12 ounce water bottles for this. Anything that's clear or opaque, you can use. And as long as it holds like four or five inches of soil, just enough to get your seeds up in the winter, basically the top half of your container is gonna act like a greenhouse. So it's gonna protect them on cold nights that dip down and it's gonna warm up the soil faster um, and the germination is gonna happen at exactly the right time. So mother nature will take care of all of the germination and growing for you. You don't have to worry about space. The only thing you have to do is when it starts getting nice out, you're going to start taking off that duct tape and opening the lid so they can start getting direct sunshine and they're going to get, there's going to start to get bigger and then you can plant them directly into the ground wherever they're going when it's time. So um, I do have a video on prepping containers for winter sowing and how I do the milk jugs. And I use a wood burner to poke holes in the plastic of the solo cups and the milk jugs and the water bottles. So that is just a quick tip there. It's a little hard if you're not burning the hole through the plastic to, um, it's hard to poke holes in the plastic. I did start with that. <laughs> it did not go well. Uh, but I found that a wood burner, you just like literally poke it. It just like burns very easily, very clean. Um, and it works really well. And the other thing that you need to remember for winter sowing, you don't add the caps onto your containers. They, you leave them off because when it snows or when it rains, you want a little bit of that moisture to go into the container. You don't want it to dry out all the way and you don't want to have to worry about watering them. And during the winter, most of the things are frozen, but you still want to give it a little bit of precipitation and that hole at the top gives it just enough uh, precipitation in there. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, direct sowing. So direct sowing is probably the easiest one. The, um, you're seeding seeds directly right into the soil at the proper planting time. So direct sowing is good for seeds and plants that don't love their roots disturbed when they've started growing. So for example, um, peas, um, who else? Uh, beets don't really like that, carrots, anything that you're gonna start and is like just like oh gosh you moved me and then it's going to sit there and be stunted you don't you can direct sow those they're they're happy just being thrown right into the soil at the proper planting time so in the winter this is going to be a, an awesome deal for poppies and poppies are the easiest thing that you can grow because you sprinkle them over wherever you want them to grow right over the soil in the winter, right on top of the snow. You can put them on top of the, on top of dirt. You can put them wherever you want that has workable soil. And in the spring, mother nature is just gonna naturally sprout them. They are super easy. They're an annual, but with the way that mother nature works and if you just keep reseeding and collecting the seeds, they're pretty much perennial. They, they will keep coming back. They're very easy to pull out if you don't want so many. I do have to thin them because the seeds are so small. And when you disperse them, sometimes you can get clusters of them or it rains and they all kind of gather in one spot. But they're really easy to thin out. They just don't like their, their roots disturbed. So they're not a good candidate for like, you know, container sowing unless you're going to be super careful and only plant one per container. That gets tricky. Um, echinacea. Any echinacea seeds are going to be great for winter sowing. They need cold stratification anyway, so it's a perfect win-win for them. Um, and if, you, if you're going to plant echinacea for, with direct sowing, you just have to make sure that you have a spot where the birds aren't going to eat the seed because, unfortunately, yellow finches love the seed. They use it for food. So if they know you've sprinkled all your echinacea seeds out on top of the soil to do their cold stratification outside during winter, they could be eaten by birds and other things. So that's the only caveat to echinacea. They need light to germinate and they need cold. But if you if you top sow them on the on soil that's outside in broad daylight, the birds are gonna be like, yeah, baby, that's some food for me. Um, dill is a good thing to direct sow. Uh, milkweed, hyssop, um, any seeds that need basically 
cold stratification, you can direct sow in the winter. You just throw them right out there now. They'll be thrilled. Um, in the spring, direct sowing, there's a few ideas down. Um, peas, beets, carrots, calendula, larkspur, and nasturtium. They all love being direct sown. Um, and in the summer, sunflowers. They actually don't even want to be um, started in pots. You can, but you, you have to like plant them within two weeks because they don't want their roots disturbed and they really don't want to be moved around. They love growing direct seeded. Um, they're, they're in the ground. They're not moved. They just establish so much better. They get bigger. They're fuller. Um, zinnias, same thing. Cosmos, marigolds, and basil. So there's there's some ideas of what you can direct sow. And you can pretty much direct sow anything except for like tomato plants because I mean, if you're in a warmer zone, you can do that. Um, in our short zone, we have to start them ahead of time, or by the time you get tomatoes, it's going to be way too late in the season to even enjoy them. So there are certain things that are better for direct sowing in a colder zone than there are in a um, warmer zone. When it comes to indoor sowing, this is where it gets a little bit um, intim intimidating for people, but... There's a lot of things, a lot of tips that you can use that are going to give you lots of success. So I'm going to go over a couple things about indoor sowing. Um, one, you have to have additional lighting for strong seedlings. You can grow things on your windowsill, but I can tell you at some point it's not going to be enough lighting. Right now, we're not getting enough daylight hours for a lot of the seedlings to thrive. So even if you had sun coming in your windows all day long, great exposure, it's not a long enough amount of time every day for them to really, you know, mature and get some girth on them and strengthen up. So you really need an additional grow light for support. Uh, requires cold stratification for certain seeds. So if you're growing indoors, unlike direct sowing outside in the winter or winter sowing, some seeds require cold stratification regardless. So if you're growing indoors, you have to mimic that for them. And that means throwing the seeds in the freezer or the fridge for at least 30 days before you germinate them. It's just going to give you more germination than just trying to sprout them and having one or two out of the whole pack come up. Um, also, it is helpful to, to keep your soil moist and your environment humid until germination. And we're going to talk about how to do that in a second as well. Um, it also requires knowing if your seeds require light or complete darkness to germinate. If you are burying seeds that require light to germinate, you're basically planting and you're gonna, it's going to be a bust because you're only going to get maybe one out of the entire pack that is like super robust and wants to grow regardless. <laughs> but for the most part, if it needs light to germinate and you bury it, it's not going to wake up. Um, vice versa, there are seeds that require complete darkness to germinate. So you need to bury them and not put them under lights. Um, so it's a little bit tricky, but most seeds, I will tell you, are pretty easy to germinate. Whether you give them light or not, they don't care. They just want that humid, moist environment that's about 65 to 75 degrees. Um, also, you need some type of tray um, to, to hold the water underneath either your trays or your containers. Um, heat mats. If you are growing in an area like I do in my basement, it's really warm. It's like 75 degrees regardless of what day, time of the year it is. So it's always warm down here. And I don't really need to use heat mats too much because a lot of things will germinate at this temperature. Uh, where it gets tricky is if you have something that wants to germinate above 75 degrees, 80 degrees, um, or if you're in a colder room, so if your normal temperature is 60 in your basement and that's where you're growing, you're going to want to throw a heat mat underneath your trays because it's going to raise the temperature about 10 to 15 degrees. So it is going to help you accelerate germination and it's just going to give them all the moist, um, all the water is going to kind of like steam up through the trays. If it's at 60 degrees, not so much. Um, but for the seeds that like the warmer temperatures to germinate, um, all your spring and summer, um, flowers, they definitely are going to want a heat mat underneath. If your growing temperature is under 75, uh, what else? And yes, this all sounds intimidating, but I, I promise you, I'm giving you good tidbits. And when you jump in and the more experience you get at growing seeds, the better and easier it's going to feel, I promise.
So when it comes to indoor sewing, let's talk about prep tips. Um, anytime you fill your trays when you're growing seeds, you want to pre-moisten your soil before you fill your trays. So grab a bucket, throw your soil in, add some water. You want to be able to squeeze it into a ball and not have it break apart, but not be able to drip water. Not Don't drain water out of it. So if you squeeze it and water comes out, it's too wet. Add more soil. Um, you just want it to be wet prior to seeding because if you don't, if you have completely dry soil, put the seed in and then water it, the water's going to bubble and it's just going to like leak right out the side of the container. The soil is not going to absorb the water like you think it should. You have to actually, you know, wet and moisten your soil prior to, so that way you get even germination and an even mix. Um, also, make sure you start with clean containers. If you're reusing containers, you should be washing them or rinsing them in a 10% bleach to water solution. That's going to kill any pathogens that could be stirring in nursery pots that you're re reusing or if something's been sitting outside and it's just been infected with spores, it's going to clean all of that up. So if you're not using new containers, uh, definitely make sure you're cleaning them and kind of disinfecting uh, the containers prior to starting them. And when you're filling your containers with soil, don't stamp, don't tamp down your soil. Don't push it down. Don't compact it. Um, what you can do is take the container like this, and you're going to actually slam it. I don't know if I can slam it like this. Slam it down on the table. So what's that, what that's going to do, it's going to take all of the air pockets out, and it's going to make the soil settle without pushing it down and being compacted. If you compact your soil, the roots can struggle to get down and you might have a little bit of trouble with germination. Hi, Jax. Jax is coming to visit me in the basement. Hmm. Um, and also have your labels and your garden markers ready because I can't tell you how many times I've sewed a, a tray of something and I cannot remember the variety or I don't know which one it was. So write your label out way before you actually plant your seeds. I'm telling you, it will save you a headache. Um, so next let's talk about germination tips. So this is something that I think a lot of people are going to, um, benefit from. So if you are planting your seeds, there's a few things you can do to help your germination, um, rates increase. One is to know what, how you're planting your seeds, know the proper depth, know whether they need light or darkness to germinate. And after they, after you plant them, spread a layer of really fine vermiculite over the soil. And that is going to stop that green algae from growing. It's not a bad thing. You can have the green algae and be successful. It's, it's, it bothers me to be on there. You can scrape it off. But when you have constantly moist soil and, and daylight or grow lights, you're going to have algae. But if you do a fine layer of vermiculite over your containers and your soil and your seed, it's going to stop that from happening. Um, so you don't have to scrape it off and it doesn't, it doesn't get all thick and disgusting. The algae is not going to kill your plants, but it is, it does get annoying. Um, also don't cover your seeds that require light to germinate. You're going to top. sow. so there's a lot of seeds that are super tiny. You're not going to bury them because if you bury them, the rule is to bury them twice their um, their height deep. So if you if you have a poppy seed, it really doesn't matter. That thing is so small, you're literally going to top sow. So if they're super tiny seeds and they even if they need darkness to germinate and they're super super tiny, you're basically you're just going to um, top sow them and put them where it's dark to germinate. You don't have to worry about covering them or anything. They're going to, they're so small. It doesn't even pay to cover them. Um, also, if you have um, seeds that require darkness to germinate and you have grow lights, you want a separate tray for them because they're going to have to germinate in the dark. So you can just put a cover over them. You can just keep the lights out in a room, put them under a cupboard, whatever you need to do, but you don't have to worry about putting them under lights um, you just keep them dark, even if you're top sewing. Also, if you are growing something that needs cold stratification, you need to mimic their winter. So I was talking about this before with uh, winter sewing. That's why winter sewing is super easy because mother nature does the cold stratifying over winter for you. 
if you're growing indoors, you don't have that luxury. So you can basically pop your seeds into the fridge for 30 days. Usually 30 days is like the average that works for all the seeds, except for daylily seeds, which need three to five weeks in the fridge. They are stubborn. They want a serious winter. They want to rest um, and they want it to be cold. Uh, do not put them in the freezer though, however. Um, just the refrigerator will work three to five weeks. And for the most part, if you're buying from a hybridizer, they already are doing that. Most hybridizers store their seeds in the fridge. Um, all of mine that I sold were definitely in the fridge for three to five weeks. And I've been sprouting them and I'm having awesome rates, like awesome germination rates with my seeds. So that is like super encouraging. And I'm also having really good luck with seed crosses that I purchased. So it's a good year for daylily germination. All right, more germination tips. When you have super small seeds or echinacea seeds that like light to germinate and you're not gonna bury them, you have to make sure in order to germinate them that they stay moist. You also have to make sure that they don't dry out once they start to germinate. If they start taking their, putting their roots out and you forget to water and you're not misting them, they don't have enough water in the bottom of the tray, um, you're going to lose them. They're going to be toast. So if you see the top of your soil kind of turning a light brown or you can just feel to the touch and feel that it's like, okay, it's starting to dry out, you can add water to the bottom of your tray or you can mist. Um, I mist for the lighter seeds and I miss for seeds that aren't germinated yet because the little seeds, you can totally dislodge them if you water from the top. You can literally splash them out, um, especially if you're top sowing. So keep your soil moist, um, keep, your, keep your lights on, but have them covered with a humidity dome. And I'm gonna talk about that in two seconds. But echinacea, that is one thing that they are, that's why I put at the bottom. Echinacea, I'm looking at you. They are top sown and they need to stay moist for like seven days before they sprout. And it is a little tough, but every day, like twice a day, in the morning, at night, keep a humidity dome on them and kind of mist them to keep them in that humid, moist environment that says, okay, it's time to wake up. All right, this is one way. The humidity domes work great. They are fitted to the trays. If you have 10, 20 trays, um, humidity domes work great. They also have little, like Gardner Supply sells smaller trays that come with the humidity domes. Um, they have taller humidity domes. It doesn't really matter what you use, just as long as you're keeping that moisture in um, and the soil isn't drying out too fast for the seeds not to germinate. I've also used saran wrap. So this, this picture here on the right-hand side that's saran wrap over a flat, like a flat six pack like this. That is one thing that I used because I didn't have it at one point. I didn't have enough humidity domes and I used saran wrap and you know what? It worked. Um, so you can get creative with that. Now, once you start to see them sprouting, this is where you get to do your little happy dance and you're like, yes, it finally happened. And you should start to see a few at a time actually sprouting. Like it should happen generally in the same, I'd say within three or four days of each other, you should have the tray, the entire tray sprouting. Um, and now your goal is basically to grow them healthy once they're up and sprouting. Well, if you have a humidity dome on there and they're all starting to sprout, you have to take the humidity dome off. Even if you have seeds that have not sprouted yet, if a good amount, I would say up to like 50% of them at least have sprouted, take that humidity dome off. You can still mist your seeds that haven't sprouted, but you don't want to leave the humidity dome on because nine times out of 10, you're going to lose them to fungus disease called damping off. Um, it just happens. And once you have it, it will kill the entire tray. So you do not want damping off. And the way that you prevent that is to immediately take off that humidity dome when you see any germination. Um, you also, once they're germinated, you want to take out the heat mats. So if you're using an alternate heat source from the bottom, remove it. Because at this point, it's done its job. They are all ready. And you can start to see if you get like a third of the tray to, you know, 40, 50% is starting to germinate. 
humidity domes and heat mats, just remove them because at this point they're up, they're off and running and it will continue to happen. Um, they're all on their way to germination. Now, sprouted seedlings, now that they're up for germination, you have the heat mats off, you have the humidity domes off, you're gonna see the little sprouts and they're gonna start to grow and grow and grow. And you're gonna be so excited. Like every day you're gonna walk downstairs and be like, yay, look at my little seedlings are getting bigger. Um, most of them are going to grow pretty quickly. There are a few that take forever to grow and to size up. But for the most part, especially daylilies, you see one little sprout one day and then literally they just start taking off. They grow super fast. Um, and the sprouted seedlings are gonna need lights. It doesn't matter what seeds you grew. If even if they needed darkness to germinate, once they germinate, they got to go under the grow lights. Uh, you're also going to add a fan and it could be just like the one in the picture, a tiny little desk fan. You can use a, a fan that really doesn't blow a lot anymore. If you have like an oscillating fan, that's like a hundred years old. Perfect. You just want to create a little air movement over the seedlings and it can, it can blow right on them. Um, but I would caution, when they are super small, don't let them dry out. So if you're going to put a fan directly on them, make sure they're up like a couple inches so that if they dry out a tad, it's okay. You have time to get to them in water with, without them becoming like completely parched. Uh, so once you see them sprouting, definitely get the air circulating, definitely get the, the, the fan going. And what that's going to do, it's going to help you prevent the damping off. And it's also going to help sturdy up the seedlings. They're little sprouts. Now think about this. If they don't have any resistance like they would outdoors, they're going to basically grow up and they don't have to have strong stems. They don't have to have strong foliage. Um, they have no adversaries, right? It's like they have a perfect growing environment and, you know, it's paradise for them. But you stick them outside and then all of a sudden they're like, oh boy, they're not sturdy enough to withstand the wind. They're just like getting blown all over the place and they look terrible when you plant them. You don't want that. So what the what the fan does is it creates like a wind and it forces them to sturdy up. So instead of swaying back and forth and being like, oh, wow, this is like crazy. It's going to actually thicken the stems up and sturdy them up so that they can withstand. And then you're going to have stockier seedlings. This works great with tomatoes, with all vegetable plants. Um, it's one thing that I have always done for my seedlings. I never not I never. How do I say this? <laughs> I never um, do not have a fan on my seedlings. There. Does that make sense? I don't know why that was so hard to come out. Um, I always have a fan. How about that? I always have a fan on my seedlings. And it also helps with fungus gnats. So if you do have them like flying around, it helps with those. Uh, they like to be wet and moist environment too. So, you know, germination is perfect for them. It like literally you can hatch them all you want. Uh, the germination period is their favorite time of year. All right, let's see. So that covers the fan. And we are going to get into now seed starting calendar. Okay, so planning your seed starting calendar. A couple things you need to know before we even start planning the calendar. One, you got to know what seed you're going to grow. Two, you have to know what zone you're in. Most people know what their growing zone is. If you don't, um, you can grow, I mean, you can grow, you can go to planthardinessars.usda.gov. That is going to bring up this map right here. And in the top of this presentation, you can see where it says you can enter and search by zip code. So you put your zip code in there. It's going to tell you what your hardiness zone is. Um, that is one way you can find it. And then also you are going to want to know when your last frost date is. Now, down here, I put, oh, too soon, too late. You don't want to plant too soon and you don't want to plant too late. And these two things that you know about your growing zone and your last frost date is going to help you with that. It is going to properly time your seed starting. It's also going to help you set your seed calendar so that you know which week to start what varieties. Uh, and it's going to set you up for success right from the get-go. So you can go to the Plant Hardiness Map website and then... Once you have your hardiness zone, I'm using this as an example. This is where I am. We are now 6A. Uh, we have moved up a bit into a warmer zone since they remapped it last at the end of last year. And so now our last frost date 
um, if you notice at the bottom here, if you go to the Farmer's Almanac, which is um, www.almanac.com and click on gardening and frost dates, you can put your zip code in there and it's going to tell you your last spring frost and your first fall frost date and how long your growing season is. As you can see, our growing season is like half of the year. It's terrible. Um, we have a very short growing season. But I, as you can see here, our last frost day used to be May 15th, and now we have moved to May 3rd. So this is very important. If you don't know anything about seed starting, you have to know your last frost date. This is why. When you're going to plan your seed starting calendar, your last frost date so I circled this, mine is May 3rd. So you can see I circled it Friday, May 3rd. I'm going to start my week, actually, my last frost date week as of May 5th. Now I do this because it makes it easier for me to go back. I'm always gonna look at Sunday because that's when the calendar start. It just makes it easy. So I'm gonna move my last frost date to the 5th just to make things easy. And now what is important is when you count backward, so week one, you see, is April 28th. So if I have to start seeds one week prior to transplant, I'm starting it the first week in, in April. If I need to go back, let's say um, zinnias, they want to be started four weeks before your last frost date. You're going to count back. Week one is the 28th. Week two is the 21st. Week three is the 14th. And week four is April 7th. So I'm going to start my zinnias at four weeks before my last frost date. And that brings me to the week of April 7th. Do I have to start it on the 7th? No, but I can start at any point in that week. And it basically is going to be four weeks before I can plant them outdoors. Your last frost date signifies when you can reasonably plant outside without a threat of frost. So most things, most seed packets, most varieties, most perennials, they want to be planted when there's no more threat of frost. Because if you put them outside and, and frost comes or you get a late snap, they're going to fry. They're going to literally shrivel up. They may recover, but they're going to look terrible. They're going to be stunted. You want to wait and base everything off of that last frost date. So that's why it's important. Now, you also have things like peppers and tomatoes. They want to be started six to eight weeks, eight to ten weeks for eggplant and 12 weeks for onions. Now that is significant. That is a big gap between your last frost date and your, um, and your sow date. So if we do onions, for example, see up here in February, it's week 12. That puts me at February 11th. So if you want to start onions, you're starting them at, on February 11th, that week, if you're in my zone, 6A. And why is that important? Well, onions actually get transplanted a month before your last frost date. So some things like to be transplanted in the cooler weather. So you're going to see sometimes you start things 12 weeks in advance of your last frost date, but you're actually going to transplant them in April. You're not actually going to wait for your last frost date because they want to be sown and transplanted in the cool weather. They establish better. So you're going to want to pay attention to when you're transplanting and when you're starting, and you're going to count back by week um, to get your this many weeks to, to um, start them. So for example, if my last frost date is May 3rd and I need to start tomatoes eight weeks in advance, this one variety says definitely do eight weeks in advance. They take a little longer to grow. I'm going back. I'm starting my tomatoes the week of March 10th and I'm starting some eggplants because I know those are eight to 10 weeks and peppers. Oh my gosh, peppers take forever too. So I'll start them the week of March 8th as well, or the week of March 10th as well. So I hope that makes sense a little bit. You're just working it backward uh, based on how many weeks uh, prior to your last frost date, you're going to sow them. Now, how do you find out what you sow when? You're gonna break out your seed packets. Now, if you ordered from me, I did not put sowing instructions in there, but I'm gonna go over those in this presentation. So that should be helpful. You can also Google like, you know, for it's echinacea, how, you know, how to grow echinacea. I'm gonna give you lots of good tips. So don't Google that. I'll give them to you here. 
<laughs> but for the most part, your seed packs are going to have all the information you need on them. Uh, for example, we are going to look on the back of the seed pack, and most of the time it says three to four weeks, four to six weeks, six to eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks, or 10 to 12 weeks. Those are how many weeks prior to your last frost date you're going to sow your seeds indoors. And that is so you have nice, healthy transplants when it comes to your last frost date. Um, when we're organizing our seed packets, one thing I like to do is to write how I'm actually going to sow them. So if you're going to sow them indoors, I would write right on the packet four to six weeks because you're going to then lump all of your four to six week seeds in one spot. So you're not necessarily going to do all your vegetables in one, one bin and all of your flowers in another bin. You actually should sort by date. So that way you know which seeds you're going to start in four to six weeks and which seeds you're going to start in the six to eight week. And that you can just write right on the calendar. Okay, I'm starting bee balm, right? Four to six weeks. I'm starting those with my zinnias. I'm starting those with my, um, my squash. I'm starting those with whatever it may be. So you're going to have a whole list of things that need to get started within that four to six week period. Does it matter if it's four weeks or six weeks? Nope. You could do it in five. I do. I usually do five weeks because it's right in the middle. And sometimes I'm late. I can't do it when I plan to start them. So it really doesn't matter. But that's the general range that you want to start them. And then what you do is you take that four to six week period, go back to the calendar where we did the week one through 12, find the four to six week slot, and then figure out what time period that is. And for this, the um, spotted bee balm, it was May 24th to April 5th. So that's when I'm putting that in my calendar. I'm writing down, yep, spotted bee balm, or I'm putting all of the four to six week varieties in one group with a rubber band around them and the date, 324 to 45. Somewhere in there around April 1st, I need to have those started. For If you're going to grow them direct sown, on the back of the packet, it will also tell you if you are direct sowing them, wait till your last frost date. So that's a significant difference. You can see if you sow them ahead of time, you're gonna get a larger plant. You're gonna have plants to transplant at your last frost date versus just seeding them at last frost. So you're kind of jumping ahead of the game and getting a jump start on your season by sowing them indoors. Uh, let's see, I think that takes care of that. Now, some seeds need light to germinate, such as Echinacea, Yarrow, Alyssum, Nicotiana. Uh, some need darkness to germinate, like calendula. They want to be buried. They don't want to see daylight. Um, delphinium, centaurum, and nasturtiums. Those are just some varieties that are finicky and definitely need either light or darkness to germinate, or you won't have much success. The ones that benefit from cold stratification, daylilies for sure. They want at least three to five weeks. St. John's wort, black-eyed Susans, echinacea, poppies, helianthus, lupins, milkweed, dill. There's a ton. If it says northern hardy on your seed packet, if it says cold tolerant on your seed packet, those are indicators that those will do well for cold stratification or they want cold stratification. And it, does, it means that they're also going to be a good candidate for winter sowing because they want that cold period and they want to have some type of a cold winter mimicked before they break their dormancy. Now, let's talk about some of the easiest plants you can grow from seed. Echinacea, and I know you're all gonna say, eh, they're not that easy, but if you have the tips and tricks and you know how to sow them, they're super easy to grow. Hyssop is super easy. Milkweed, daylily, um, heliopsis, my cat's coming to say hi. Um, blackberry lilies, super easy, and chives. And chives are perennials. So those are all perennials that are going to come back and they're super easy to start. Also, if you notice, there are also a lot of the ones that want to be cold stratified, which is why they're also a super easy way to um, winter sow them. It's a good way to get a jump start on the season. And if you don't have a lot of space, throw them in a container in a milk jug out in your garden and you're going to have plants when you're ready for um, your last frosting. And then they'll be ready for planting. Um, annuals that are really easy to grow from seed, zinnias, um, dill, cosmos, calendulas, sunflowers, poppies. Those are some of the easiest ones. A lot of them you can just literally direct seed and they are going to, 
they're going to sprout. <laughs> they say hi to my kitty cat. Hello. Um, he always loves to like jump on my lap and my computer at the most inopportune times, but he's my buddy. All right. So we can talk about echinacea. We'll do echinacea first and then we're going to do day lilies. Um, echinacea, they really, there's a few keys to germinating them properly and growing them well. And I've touched on them already, but they need cold stratification. Pop those little, a little baggie or the little container or the little envelope that I mailed out. Um, pop those in the fridge for 30 days prior to when you're starting them. They need light to germinate. So again, when you're sowing them, pre-moisten the soil, top sow them. You can lightly cover with vermiculite. Um, that won't bother them. And then water them in or mist them into water. And then start your seeds um, early. If you can start and you're going to grow indoors, start them in February. And I'm in 5B, 6A, and I start my echinacea in February. And that does two things. One, it allows for me to have really decent sized starts to my season. And they bloom at the same time as the other echinacea in my garden. So any of my seedlings, I've learned February, perfect. If you want blooms your first year from an echinacea seed grown plant, you'll get them. You just got to start them early. You can also winter sow these and have decent starts, but it'll take a little bit longer for them to bloom. Let's see. Also, if I start in February, guess where my seeds are right now? <laughs> okay, so half of them are on my front porch because it's like freezing cold and we're getting a snowstorm, um, but they don't care. So all my seeds, the, the seed pack, the mix that I'm growing, which is the same mix that I sold, is in my fridge. That envelope is sitting in my fridge and it will sit there until February, probably the first week in February. I will take those out and start sowing them. But they're getting their winter mimic either on my front porch in a paper bag or in my crisper drawer in the fridge. Um, if you're starting in February, you should expect to get a plant. So during your season, the plant is going to grow to the size you would find it at a nursery. So if you have a one gallon size pot, like a normal one that you would buy at the nursery, that it, they go for like, what, 23 bucks. I mean, this year the prices were so insane. I couldn't even, I couldn't even look at them. Uh, but they grow them and you'll get like a decent size one gallon container plant if you grow them early. Uh, let's see. And it will take you about two years for it to gain um, full size to get to maturity. So it'll, the second year it blooms, if you start them early the first year, like right now, if you start them in February and grow them, transplant them out into the yard at your last frost date, and then next year they'll be full size. So that's going to be the two full years. If you winter sow them, they may not get to the really a huge plant size by the end of the season, unless you have a longer growing season than we do. Um, but then your next year, it might take you two to three years to get a full size plant. But if you start early, you get it like second year is a charm. They are magnificent in their second year. So echinacea being it likes to be cold stratified, it's a great candidate for winter sowing, direct sowing or indoor sowing. The only problem with direct sowing, again, is the birds. You want to make sure that you have a way to sort of keep the seed on top of the soil without it getting eaten. Um, it blooms its first year from seed, and it's one of the easiest perennials you can grow. It's also a top um, preferred plant by pollinators. Echinacea is amazing. It, it brings in the most butterflies and the most bees of, like, any plant that I grow. Um Birds love the seed, like I mentioned, so it can be a pro and a con, but it's also easy to grow and collect more seeds. So here's what you can expect when you grow echinacea from seed. So in the left-hand picture, I collected all of the seed, um, and I'm showing the seed is not actually that black spiky stuff. That's the part of the seed head. Um, it's the little brown arrowhead like you can see in the center photo, and that is Fuzzy little white stuff coming down from the arrowhead in the middle photo. That's the root. So when I tell you that they want to be top sown, this is them top sown in a pot in under a grow light. Uh, and the light is on before they've even germinated. And this is what happens. Their root comes out. This is why you have to keep them moist. But it will find its way 
down into the pot and work its way in. So that's what you can expect to see when it when the seed germinates. And then the right hand side is a whole tray of germinated um, echinacea seedlings. Isn't that pretty? I love them. And they go they grow fairly fast as well. Um, and then this is the tray. So on the left hand side, I have those outside hardening off. And you can see they've gotten quite big from their um, from their little seedling state. But that's from February to this is probably late April, beginning of May that I have them outside. So that's the size that they get um, while they're growing indoors before they get transplanted. And then you can see some of the blooms. So you can grow green twister from seed and it will come true to seed. Echinacea purpurea will come true to seed. And then on the right hand side, these are seedlings that that I grew from my seed collected. But you can see underneath, see that little peachy one? That's on the same plant as the pink one. It's the same stem and it's just a different colored flower. So you can get some really fun stuff happening with seeds that you collect. If you have a ton of varieties in your yard and you let the bees do all the work and then just collect the seed and grow them out. Oh my gosh, you're going to find some fun stuff. Oh, my cat's hair is like flying all over. All right. Can you go? Thank you. All right. Let's see. No, move it. All right, so let's talk about daylilies. Daylilies, um, you can grow them indoors. And why do we want to grow them indoors? Because they do just as good outdoors. You can grow them winter sowing. You can direct seed them right in the ground, bury them. They'll come up. Um, Mother Nature can do all the work for you. But the benefit of growing the daylily seeds indoors over the winter is that they're going to bloom. Well, I don't want to guarantee they're going to bloom. Some of them bloom their first year. And then you can see what the babies look like. So about 30% of what you grow, that's been my kind of percentage. And it's been pretty consistent. Of all the seedlings I grow, I get like a third of them that bloom the first year. And then the second year you get the rest of them. So it's a really fun process. And it's fun to see either what you create or if you've purchased seeds from a hybridizer, it's really fun to see what they created and you get traits that you don't have um, from flowers that are not in your yard. You kind of get a whole new flower. You get to create something nobody else has. And hopefully it's unique and pretty. And sometimes they're not, but that's okay too. That's all part of the process. Uh, but it gives you something to grow over the winter. And daylilies, it doesn't matter when you start them. They have no timeline. You can start them now. You can wait until March. You can wait whenever. The earlier you start them, the bigger chance that you're going to have um, a first year bloom on them. But there's no timeline. You can start them whenever you want, and they're just going to keep growing until winter kills them off and makes them go dormant. And then they'll come back the next year and bloom. So there's no like hard and fast timeline, weeks to transplant, none of that with day lilies. You can start them whenever you want. Um, and how I start them is with hydrogen peroxide and um, a bottle of water and paper towels. I don't actually put the seeds in a pot and cover them with soil and keep them moist. You can do that. That's super easy to do. But what I like to do is take one cap, take the cap off the water bottle, fill it up with hydrogen peroxide and dump the cap into the water bottle. That's all you need. Or just a little squirt. It, you don't even have to be super like, you know, specific about how much peroxide, but you just put a squirt of peroxide into the water bottle and you use that to wet the paper towels um, and you wrap the seed back up into the paper towel and put it out at 75 degrees. So if that means that it's just in on a warm spot, put it above your fridge, you know, where it's like nice and warm, put it somewhere where it's got a little bit of warmth, but it's not overly hot. Do not use a heat mat to um, warm up your seeds. I have cooked many. <laughs> I literally boiled them. And I don't know, that was a bad learning curve for me because I'm sure that I ruined some amazing crosses, but you know, that's what happened. That's, that's trial and error, right? Um, but yeah, so don't use a heat mat to germinate your daylily seeds after being in the fridge at like, you know, 37 degrees and then coming out to a warm temperature with water, they're going to sprout. They do really well with that. Um, so once they got their three to five um, weeks in the fridge, wrap them up in the paper towel, just take your water bottle and, and take a little bit and wet the paper towel. And I'm talking about, this is like a three inch by three inch square of paper towel. I'm actually going to show you because I have some, hang on. 
So here's a little seed packet. And I know this is probably really hard. I have to figure out where the camera is showing. But this is the tiny little seed pack or um, envelope that you would have received your seeds in. And it has a little piece of paper towel in it and the seeds are inside. So that's what you wet. You literally take out the paper towel. And I'm gonna open this up and just show you. Oh, and I have sprouts and I do have sprouts in there. Cool, I just got this back in. So anyway, so this is without dropping them. This is the seed in the paper towel and the paper towel is, is moist. Now, you, if I squeeze this and water comes out, it's too much. You just want this kind of damp. You don't, you can wet it. Um, and if it's too much water, just turn the baggie upside down, squeeze it right out, let the drops come out. But you just want it, you want it moist, not sopping wet. You don't want excess water in here because you're going to rot your seeds. You just want enough moisture to get them to germinate and feel all, you know, all cozy and warm in there. Um, and again, there's the... Um, 12 ounce bottle of water, one cap full of hydrogen peroxide, and you add only enough to moisten the paper towel, squeeze out the extra, do not place on a heat mat, but keep it at regular room temperature. Literally 65 to 75 is perfect. Uh, they don't need much. And then you're gonna start checking for germination and or rotting after four days. Every four, every four days or four days after I actually put them into the envelope and I moisten them, I've had sprouts this year, especially things like sprouted four days was the soonest I had a sprout. And then you will continue to see them sprout various times over the next three weeks. Some are a little more stubborn than others. So you have to be patient and not all of them germinate at the same time, even if it's the same cross. So I have seven seeds in this envelope, three of them germinated and four of them haven't. So over the next couple of days, I would expect those to germinate, but you're not going to get them all at once. Um, sometimes you do, but it's not, you know, don't worry if they don't all germinate at the same time. Um, you also are going to check for mushy seeds. And unfortunately, I don't want to say that that's, you know, it'll never happen if you don't put it, you know, if you, if you do the right amount of water, it'll never happen. Some seeds are just not viable and they will just rot or they just weren't like dried properly and now you have them sitting in water and both. It doesn't matter. Some of them are just gonna rot. It happens, it just happens. It is what it is. Um, but you wanna remove the mushy seeds if you do have them. And my finger in this picture is actually testing a seed. You can take a seed um, and put it between your fingers and just push on it. If it's firm, it's still good. If it squishes and, or it's soft, it's no good. You got to get rid of it. It's just going to mold. Uh, let's see. Now we can do tips for sprouting seeds indoors. All right. So you can also just plant them like I show in the picture in the soil and they will sprout. You can put a whole bunch of seeds at the same cross in a pot and let them sprout. You got to keep it moist. The benefit to doing this paper towel method, and that's what I show in this picture. These are all seed baggies with wet paper towel with the water and hydrogen peroxide. The benefit to doing that is then I get to see which ones actually germinate and I'm planting and potting those up. So I'm going to have like 100% um, germination in the pots. <laughs> I'm not going to waste soil. You know, I'm not going to put all the seeds in the pot waste all of the soil. I've done that before and I grow a ton of them. It's not gonna be a big deal for you if you're only growing 10 daylily seeds, but if you're growing 50 to 100 or 1000 daylily seeds, trust me, you wanna sprout them and pick which ones germinate and, and plant them. If, they, if you have some that don't germinate, they don't germinate, it is what it is. Um, but it's just a little bit more, you have more control over how many are germinating when you actually see that the root is sprouting out of the seed. And that's how I prefer to do it. So what does it look like? What does germination look like with daylilies? So on the left-hand side, you can see with a kind of pinky tint background, that's on a paper towel. And there are what, six seeds there and three, maybe four, um, have started to germinate. That little white, um, kind of looks like the little white tips that are coming out of the three middle seeds. Those, that's the root. So that means that those seeds are up and ready and ready to be planted. 
it doesn't matter if you wait until it looks like the fourth seed in the right picture. Um, it doesn't matter if you plant them, as long as you know that they've started to germinate and even just cracked open a little bit and you can see the white, that seed's good. It's ready to go. So that can get planted right into a soil, into its own cell, or you can take all six of those seeds and plant them knowing that you're going to get at least three. Um, the rest of them will probably germinate, but I do like to know that the seeds I plant have already sprouted. So I know, you know, what I'm, I hate waiting. So they can, they can germinate and be as stubborn as they want in the baggie, but I like to know which ones are going to be germinated in the soil and ready to go. Um, and on the right-hand side, I always thought this was a really cool picture. So I had opened a seed baggie and a cross um, that I was growing, and I only had four seeds, and they all were germinated, but they germinated at different times. So the one was like just starting, and then you can see the other ones, they all germinated at different times. And the one on the right hand side shows the little leaf that that little green speck that is that little sprout that is the leaf the first leaf of the day lily starting to grow up so now if you were to plant these all of them would get buried all of the seeds would get buried below the soil and that one on the far right side that little green sprout would be just peeking out i wouldn't bury that under the soil i would just bury everything below it um, but this is pretty cool because this is what it looks like when the seeds germinate And then of course you have the progression of them growing. So the left-hand side is your seeds sprouting in the envelope. Sometimes you get really distracted and you don't check on your seedlings and they are off and running and they actually produce leaves <laughs> while they're in the paper bag. I mean, while they're in the little plastic baggie um, in the paper towel. So if you ignore them, they are still gonna grow, uh, but they could look like that when you take them out. And then you want to pot them up and that is these sprouts and again you can plant them one to a pot you can plant more than one you can put all the same cross in a in the same uh pot except that when they start to get bigger you're going to have to separate them out i generally give each seedling its own pot and i label it um, or its own cell and then label it and then they get potted up the more you pot them up and the bigger they grow the more of a chance that you're going to have to see it bloom so if you leave all six seeds in one pot that's only four inches big, the chances of that getting big enough to bloom this year is going to be pretty small. They'll live and they'll thrive just fine, but they're not going to produce that bloom because they're going to be kind of just too squished to, you know, absorb all the excess nutrients. You'd have to feed them a lot and they would outgrow that pot, if there, especially if there's five or six seeds in there. Now, our goal is to get these healthy, deep roots with nice, lots of green foliage. That's the, that's the goal. So we have the seedling on the left that has been growing for probably two, three weeks. And then we have the ones on the, in the middle uh, that show you what the size of the roots and the seedlings look like after a month or two of growing. So they grow pretty fast. And that means when they get that big and they start to outgrow their cells that they were planted in, it's time to pot them up and give them a one gallon container if you have the room i've had um day lilies that i've grown in solo cup size pots and actually one in a solo cup this year that actually produced a bloom and because I, I never got to pot it up and i got so busy and it actually produced a bloom at the end of the season <laughs> in the solo cup it never got potted up and it was like totally root bound in the solo cup and it produced a bloom so you never know they're really not finicky they day lilies are really the best um and then Right before your last frost date, and I would say about a couple weeks before your last frost date, you're going to start hardening off your plants. So up until this point, your plants have only had um, artificial light, basically. They've been, had the grow light, and they've been babied. You really want to get them acclimated to the outdoors, and the way you do that is called hardening off your plants. You bring them outside for the first day. You bring them out for just an hour of straight sunlight. Or you can put them in the shade for like three hours. If it's cloudy out, you can bring them out for like one to three hours. But if you have straight sunshine, bring them out for a dip for an hour for the first day. The next day, bring them out for like three, two to three hours, and then bring them back in, put them under lights. Uh, bring them out the third day for like four to five hours. You're just allowing them to build up and get used to all direct sunshine. If you just bring them outside and let them do their thing in full sunshine without ever acclimating them to direct sunshine, 
they're going to fry. They're going to get sunburned. They like bleach out. If you've ever had tomato plants and you've done that, you know that they turn like totally white. It's like they have total sunblock on them. Um, they get like sunburned and it's not good to do because then it just stunts them and it's not a, it's not a fun thing to do after you've babied them since what, January? Uh, so you want to acclimate them a little at a time, an hour a day, an hour every other day until you can get them outside. So you can start two weeks before your last frost. I only hard mine off for a week. Um, I find that that's pretty sufficient. And as long as the temperatures are above frost um, and there's no frost in the forecast, those babies go in the ground or they can stay right outside and they get the natural sunlight because that's what they really want. Um, I hope this is, this was helpful. I hope this went, um, you know, provided you guys with some good information and answered some questions. I'm sure it didn't answer all. And I could literally dive into all of these topics for like an hour. I could talk, oh my gosh, probably for like the entire year on some of these topics. Each one of these topics has like so much, so many layers to it that I could go forever. But I do have videos on prepping containers. I do have videos on how to start seeds indoors. Um, there's lots of videos that I have showing this. So I will put the links to them if you want to actually look at me doing them and potting them up and showing how I'm doing them. Um, we will do that. I will post those so that you have access to the links. Uh, but the only other thing that I don't think I mentioned was about the grow lights. And I'm going to do another one of these. Once your seedlings are really good size, I'm going to go over like pest management for the fungus gnats. I'm going to go over care, potting up, when to fertilize, how often to fertilize, what to fertilize with. Uh, we're going to, there's going to be another session of this, but it's already been an hour. So I don't want to like really push it. Uh, <laughs> there's like so much information, but one thing I want to say is once your day lilies or once your um, seedlings get big enough and they go under lights, the lights should only be a couple inches above the plants. So if you notice in this picture, the daylilies in the back with the bigger grow light, they're only literally like three or four inches away from the, from the light. And these are T5 grow lights. They don't get hot. If you have fluorescent lights that get hot, you're going to want to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, don't put them right near them. But for these kind of grow lights, the closer, the better. The more intense, the more um, light they get, the faster they grow. If you have them too high above your lights, they're going to they're gonna stretch. They're going to kind of get leggy. They want that intense light bearing down on them. So you're really only going to keep them like four inches away from the lights. So get them as close as you can to your seedlings. And the good thing about grow lights, if you have a setup, you have adjustable um you have adjustable chains, so you can raise them as the plants get bigger. The other thing is, in order um, for your seedlings to have enough light, they should be on for 12 to 14 hours. Sometimes mine are only on for 10 to 12 hours because I'm tired, I'm going to go to bed. But if you have a timer, you can get plug-in timers. They plug into the outlet, and then you plug the um, grow light into the timer, and it will automatically turn off on and off 6 a.m., 6 p.m., or you know, 10 a.m., 10 p.m., however you want to do it, it's automatic. And that is so easy if your life is super busy and you don't have time to like, you know, or you get tired and you forget to you leave them on all night. The timer is a really good thing. It automatically manages that for you. Uh, I'm not sure how I skipped over that. But anyway, so I hope this was super helpful. And then at three o'clock, I am going to do the live question and answer on Facebook. I am most likely going to do a video, um, a video chat in Zoom. So that way I can see you guys and I can access the chat questions. So I will see you guys. I will post the link when it's time and you guys can all join in the chat. If you want to just tell me what you're growing, give me some feedback on this presentation. Um, ask me your questions if you have specific questions that I didn't answer. But I hope you found this super helpful and I can't wait to grow along with you this winter.